welcome everybody. I'm Vincent Medley. I am the Maddie's director for the Human Animal Support Services Project. Uh, we have another exciting webinar. Thank you all for attending. Um, before we get started with our webinar today, which is navigating compassion fatigue in an animal well in animal welfare, how to combat burnout and enhance uh, resiliency. I'm going to review a few housekeeping notes. So number one in Zoom, you'll see the Q&A option at the bottom next to the chat option. Please use the Q&A to submit any questions you have for the panelists uh, to ensure we see your question. Uh, please use the chat to engage throughout the presentation. And we ask that you stay on topic in the chat in order to chat with each other. Please use the blue uh, drop down in the chat box and switch it to everyone. And as far as those questions, we're gonna make sure you, those questions get answered um, at the end of the presentation. Also remember, the, this um, a recording of this webinar will be distributed within three days in the, uh, to the email that you registered with. If you don't see it in your inbox after three days, please be sure to check your spam or visit humananimalsupportservices.org backslash webinars and then lastly, please stay tuned to fill out a brief poll at the very end of the webinar. So without further delay, I wanna introduce somebody that I um, have so much respect and so happy to be, uh, have as part of one of our webinars. Um, on a side note, I used to work for her at the, uh, uh, the Humane Society of the United States, uh, a fabulous person who is, someone who exemplifies everything that you will hear in this with this um this webinar um and somebody that i've really patterned a lot of my style after um but without that's off script so let me just say i am introducing for tonight's webinar navigating compassion fatigue and animal welfare how to combat burnout and enhance resiliency we will hear from hillary hager she is the vice president of outreach engagement and training for the Humane Society of the United States. And now I'll turn it over to you, Hillary. Oh, you flatterer, Vincent, thank you so much. Um, can you just confirm with me that you can see my screen? Are you good? Yes, I can, okay. uh, yeah, yep, I can Excellent. see your screen share. Um, great, well, thanks, thank you very much, um, Vincent and Tahas for having me. And, and it's so great to see so many of you here and to see how many of you are here and my hunch is this webinar called to you because things are really hard right now. So I appreciate that you are prioritizing this and having this conversation in the midst of all the things that are going on and how challenging this work feels right now. So I appreciate you being here. Um, so as Vincent said, I'm vice president of outreach engagement and training at HSUS. I've been here with the organization for about 12 years, uh, just a little over. And I, uh, but prior to coming to HSUS, I worked in two different animal shelters here in Washington State, uh, where I live. So the first was kind of a limited intake, low euthanasia nonprofit shelter with a pretty high live release rate and really robust programs, where I oversaw the volunteer program, uh, Cats Only Adoption Center in the city of Seattle, a handful of programs. I was there for about six and a half years, then got my master's degree in nonprofit leadership and left to go to work in a municipal shelter in the city where I was living. And at that time they were, you know, open admission with breed specific legislation, taking in around 9,000 animals a year with a live release rate somewhere in the 60% range. And I managed the volunteer program, the foster care program, the transfer program, and all the outreach and education programs for the shelter. Um, and then I was one of two managers. So I sort of did all of the things um, from intake to adoption, from animal care to dispatch to field services. Um, and then also I'm a, a certified euthanasia technician. So I assisted with euthanasia as well. So sort of had my hands in all of the things in the shelter. Um, and so uh, I also have been a volunteer in animal organizations. I've done wildlife rehab. I um, served on the board of directors for chimpanzee sanctuary here in Washington, was president of our state federation for a long time. And I share all of that with you to say kind of two things. One is that uh, I sometimes overcommit and say yes when I should say no, which is, a bummer and that's a lesson I keep having to remind myself of but also just to share with you that I'm kind of in this with you and Vincent you said very nice things but I also would not want anyone to ever have the idea that I have this all dialed in <laughs> some sort of zen master because I I work on these things all the time because it is 
uh, very common. I and mean, compassion fatigue is sort of an occupational hazard for caring as much as we do. So um, it is normal and appropriate for us to have these kinds of, um, to have challenges doing this work. And so I'm, I'm in it with you. I also feel like every part of our work has, we have gotten so much better in the 20 plus years now that I've been doing animal protection work. We have perfected in many ways, so many of the things that we're doing and improved them vastly, like from veterinary care to enrichment for the animals in our care, to keeping pets in homes for owner support, for customer service, for field services, all investigations, legislation, all the ways that we serve animals, we've gotten better at doing. Um, and that's awesome. But also it doesn't matter how well we do our jobs if we're miserable while we do it and, and really suffer while we're doing the work. And, um, and I think there are a lot of us who are called to do this work, who feel compelled to be here um, and also really struggle with how this work affects our lives um, in, in all kinds of ways. So I think it's really important to have these conversations. And some of you um, may be struggling yourself. Some of you may be working in teams with people who are having a hard time. Some of you may be leaders in your organizations and thinking about how you can create a space for people to sustain themselves and stick around. And I think hopefully we'll have a, an opportunity to kind of touch on all of these things, but I think it's really important for us to look at those levels, at the individual, at the team, and then from an organizational level, because there are roles that each that each of us have to play in each of those areas to try to help sustain ourselves and to create a healthy work environment for our teams. Um, so without further ado, I'll sort of jump in. This is, you know, this is, I do this workshop in all kinds of formats. Um, usually it's more than 45 minutes. So this is a jogging tour meant to be a start of the conversation. I also am going to uh, provide a list of resources that links to books and webinars and TED Talks and all kinds of stuff that you'll be able to access with this recording later. So please understand, I'm just touching on things that we will um, that you can do a little bit more of an investigation on down the road. What I will say generally is that, you know, compassion fatigue, as I say, it's an occupational hazard and it is a normal consequence of being in a caring profession and, and being mission oriented. And so the idea that people could be negatively affected emotionally by their work started really showed up in the literature in the early 1900s, focused around humans who were responding to humans in crisis. And then in the 80s, we started talking about how it was being, how people who were working with animals and animal shelters were being affected. Um, and at that time, many more millions of animals were coming into shelters and many mil millions more of animals were being euthanized. And so there was this weird notion that there was a correlation between euthanasia and compassion fatigue. And while certainly it is true that for some people, euthanasia is a real pain point, obviously we do everything we can to prevent um, unnecessary euthanasia um, and, and to ensure the placement of healthy and adoptable animals. And also that's not usually the thing. Usually, um, usually the thing has to do with working with the public, organizational policies, um, lack of resources that really can make things more complicated for us in this space. But it's not just people working with animals. It's not just people doing direct care. I mean, there are ecologists who are freaking out about collapsing frog populations and attorneys working with separated families who, who also experience compassion fatigue. What I do think is a little bit more challenging for us is the deep emotional connection that people feel for animals. And so we have this really like a calling. Many people have a calling to do this work to alleviate the suffering of animals. Um, and then continue to be exposed to the distress of people and animals in this work, which makes it especially painful. Um, I think that there is also a flavor of activism that has people feeling like if animals are suffering, then we must feel also obligated to suffer in order to alleviate the suffering of others. Um, and I would say to that over my career, I have kind of concluded that I don't believe that the animals would ever ask us to suffer on their behalf. And I think that's maybe one of the reasons why we feel such deep connections to animals is that they don't ask that of us. And so I think it's an important narrative for us to challenge. What I wanna call out though, before we go any further is that experiencing compassion fatigue doesn't just get in the way of your quality of life outside of work. Um, and I feel like I need to differentiate that here because most people I know in this business don't really have a life outside of work. So when I say that, they're like, no big deal. What do I care? I don't have a life outside of work. No, no problem. Um, you should probably watch the webinar that Lindsay Hamrick, my friend and colleague, did about work-life balance um, to start exploring the ways that you could have better work-life balance. But what I also think I want to call, what I want to call out here is that it affects your ability to do your work, right? And most of us who are in this business are doing this, we try to do more and more, right? There's so much to do, we try to do more and more and we over-deploy, which means that we're, we're undermining our ability to bring our best work to this problem that we're trying to solve in, in caring for animals. 
So I think it's important, like each of us is deserving of joy in our lives and should take care of ourselves and find a way to address this so that we can access the joy there is in the world and have a really incredible quality of life for this very short life that we have. But also, if you don't care about any of that and you're really just focused on improving the world for animals, you will be better at your job and better at saving animals if you prioritize your own well-being and address this in meaningful ways so that you can sustain yourself in this field to be here for the long haul so that you don't burn out and have to leave. And then we have to start all over with new folks. We want to be able to sustain people's careers and find ways for them to do this work that doesn't involve suffering. And I really differentiate between sadness and suffering. Sadness is normal and co a normal consequence of this work. Suffering is what happens when we don't metabolize that sadness and become overwhelmed by it. So we have to figure out a way to sort of walk that balance. So just to get us kind of on the same page with some definitions, um, here's what I will offer. Burnout, sometimes people sometimes use these terms interchangeably. So let me just say this, it's a burnout is what is a common sort of effect of the stress of being in any kind of workplace, plus or minus animals, plus or minus emotional um, involvement um, with your with your work or the people you work with or animals. So, you know, problems with coworkers, lack of ec economic security, like feeling like you don't have a lot of control over what's going on in your work can lead to burnout. And characteristics of burnout are showing here, right? Emotional exhaustion, alienation from work-related activities and reduced performance. So that's burnout. And it can happen to anyone in any kind of job. My husband has a job that has nothing to do with animals and no emotional involvement. And he is uh, totally burnt out. So compassion fatigue, though, is the emotional and physical burden created by the trauma of helping others in distress. Um, and that which leads to a decrease in our own empathy towards suffering in the future. Um, so, um, so the characteristics of compassion fatigue are here, where you might experience intrusive negative thoughts. You could have physical problems such as GI issues or headaches or lethargy, experiencing a loss of hope, questioning your own contribution to the field, um, skepticism and guilt. So there are a few other symptoms that I will share um, here in a second. But I think that sometimes the term compassion fatigue is misleading because people feel like it suggests that, oh, well, I cared a lot and I got tired. And certainly it's exhausting to care as much as we do. But really, compassion fatigue is about our exposure to the trauma plus this, um, this decreased capacity to care moving forward. Like I care too much and now I care less over time. So these are terms I think that are helpful, but the way that I like to frame this up and think about it is around how we steward our exposure to that trauma. So in another, at another time, we can have a conversation about all the flavors of trauma. Let me give you the quick and dirty breakdown though. There, there are different kinds of trauma. So there's like primary trauma and that's the trauma that happens to you. Like if you're hit by a car, <laughs> it's primary trauma. There's also secondary trauma though. So you could be the kennel tech working with the dog who was hit by a car. So you weren't injured, but you are experienced, you're exposed to the trauma of the dog who was hit by a car and affected by it. There's also tertiary trauma, right? So you could be the admin working with the kennel tech who is hit by, who, you're the admin working with the kennel tech who's working with the dog who's hit by a car. So you maybe never even have your hands on the dog who is hit by a car, but you are working in a system where people are affected by trauma and that can have an impact on you. So I have read, that up to 60% of people who are in caring professions have experienced primary trauma. And I remember when I first read that, I was like, what, 60%, like, that's crazy, that seems so high. And then I started thinking about all of the people I know and all the trauma there is to go around and realize that 60% is maybe low. And the reason I mentioned that is that you, you can't like self-care your way out of trauma. There, your body has a response to trauma, um, both in your brain and then in the physical sense that requires work really with a mental health professional to process and sort, to manage your trauma response. So if you are a person who statistically is in that 60% of people who experienced primary trauma and have not done the work to resolve that, your continued exposure to other trauma can be very triggering and make everything much more complicated. So I just wanna put in a plug for accessing mental health services. But I think it's also important to acknowledge that we are people who are putting ourselves into this space of trauma. And we have to figure out how we're going to manage and steward our way through it. So the definition here that I love around trauma stewardship comes from this book, which is one of the ones I'll ref refer you to, um, who talks about like that really what we're doing is having a conversation about who we are, how we come to do this work, how we're affected by it, 
and how we make sense of it and learn from our experiences. Because we are all very different people with different origin stories about how we came to do this work, right? Like some of us were born and our parents were like, oh my God, she's destined to work with animals. Others of us stumbled across it accidentally and fell into this, but like accidentally and like, here we are. So we all have come from different places and have different origin stories. And we also have different levels of sensitivity to things, right? Like if I were some sort of terrible person, I might think it's a good idea to show you a video of something horrible happening to an animal and ask you to tell me on a scale of one to 10, how awful you thought it was. And you can imagine some people would see it and think like, oh my gosh, that's like a 10. I'm never going to be able to get that out of my brain. And other people might see it and think like, what's the big deal? Like I see that every day or like that was my Tuesday. Like, why are you even getting upset about it? So we all have different levels of sensitivity. And sometimes we assume sameness from other people. Like if I find something upsetting, then you should find it upsetting. And if you don't, you're kind of a monster (laughs) or like, that's not upsetting to me. Like, why are you so upset right now? I don't get it. It's not a big deal. So it can kind of go both ways. But so we are these people who will put ourselves into this space and then have to understand how it affects us. And I think it's important to say very carefully and clearly, this work fundamentally changes the way that we view the world around us. Like we have seen things that other people haven't seen. The things that we have seen affect the way that we experience our environment around us. Um, You know, and if you have ever driven down a highway and seen a bag of garbage on the side of the road or a rubber band container and assumed that there are kittens or puppies inside, then you know this dynamic. Like I ask normal people who don't do this work about this and they're like, oh yeah, somebody's littering. And like, I listen to true crime podcasts, so I think there are dismembered bodies in there. Like, I'm not saying that's a healthier perspective, but the things that we think and experience in our day-to-day life influence our, the way we experience the world around us. So here we are, people who have raised our hands to do this very hard work and who are affected by it. And often we are the last people to know how affected by it we are. And if we had some sort of neutral third-party observer who we could check in with, who could say the honest truth without us getting mad or without worrying if they were going to hurt our feelings, if we could go to them and say, how do you think I'm holding up? How do you think this work is affecting me? And if they felt like they could be really honest, might actually say, you know what? I don't think it's going so well. And I always think about Morgan Freeman. He's my uh, narrator, you know, and I think every moment where I'm like, this is fine, whatever, it's fine. I can picture Morgan Freeman and he's always saying, and she was not fun. Um, because we are the last people to recognize when things aren't working for us. And so I often will check in, like, how, how am I showing up right now? What does this look like? Is this really working for me? And, and, so, and if the answer is no, that means I sort of have to make a tweak, right? So how am I affected by it? And then what am I going to do about it? Because if I'm committed to staying in this work and this feels like the place where I want to be and where I want to attend and, and, and put my energy and the change I want to make, then I have to figure out how I'm going to be all right in this space. And for many of us, I think the conversation is like, oh, well, that thing's hard, or if we just had more money, or if there were just, you know, more adopters, if we had more space, or if that person would retire, or whatever, fill in the blank, like if just this other thing would happen, everything would be fine. And what really we have to do is is figure out how to be, even if nothing else around us changes. And that's really tricky because we're people who like to make change. <laughs> we're, we're trying to change the world around us all the time. And so to be in the space of going like, yeah, I don't have the ability to influence any of that stuff. I can only influence the way that I am in this moment is pretty tricky and it takes some practice. But I think that's really where the power resides because if you are busy all the time trying to influence everything else around you, you're going to be real disappointed because you can't do that very well. So now I want to talk about the compassion fatigue trajectory So this is um, sort of what happens to people when they come into this work. And you can see on the one axis, it's level of performance. And then the other is continued exposure to stress over time. And uh, and hopefully you can tell there's a dotted line indicating a decreasing level of performance, right? So what happens is people come into this work, they're super stoked, they're super motivated, they're jumping in, they're volunteering, they're going the extra mile, they're offering to do all the things, um, but that's not super sustainable. And with continued exposure to stress over time, they wind up over here in this irritability phase where they might begin to cut corners, where they're starting to avoid people or mock people or denigrate people. And they start distancing themselves from friends and colleagues. And then uh, with continued exposure to stress over time and no attention brought to it, their performance decreases even more. And they wind up in this withdrawal phase where they're tired and don't wanna talk about work. 
where their enthusiasm for the work turns sour, where they start to neglect family, friends, coworkers, and themselves, and actively try to avoid sadness and pain. And then with continued exposure to stress over time, they can wind up over here in the zombie phase where their hopelessness turns to rage, where everyone else is ignorant or incompetent, where they're just filled with disdain for others. They have no patience, no humor, no time for anything else. So this can look really uh, bleak. And <clears throat> sometimes people look at this and they're like, oh, are we just doomed? Maybe, <laughs> if I'm honest. But sometimes people look at this and they're like, oh, well, we dealt with this. Oh, that seems like that's the, that's the sweet spot, huh? Um, and I would say probably not. Uh, probably not. Um, the most notable characteristic I think of the zealot phase is that people are saying yes when they should be saying no, and they have terrible, terrible boundaries. Um, and it simply is not sustainable to be able to do this over time. Um, they're, they're, uh, and it's much harder to establish boundaries after the fact, after you've blown past them, and then it is if you just can, can maintain them from the very beginning. So it sets a lot of unrealistic expectations for yourself. Other people develop unrealistic expectations of you. Um, and, you know, if you're busy doing all of the things, you have to acknowledge that there are some things that aren't getting done, right? Like you're doing all the stuff for animals, but like, what's your kitchen look like? And how much laundry do you have piled up? And I'm not here to shame anybody for having a messy kitchen. But also I think it's under, important to understand, like we are making choices about where we are bringing our time and attention. And when we focus it so much on work, there are other things that are going to fall off the plate. And also, frankly, I will say it can be very annoying for people who are further down on the spectrum when like the new person shows up and they're like, let's do it. Like, oh God, we're tired. Like, well, and so what a lot of times will happen is we'll be like, fine, okay, you go do it. Like I'm exhausted. I don't have the time or space to do it, but go ahead and knock yourself out. And I think there it's really important that we think about how we have conversations to help people to understand this trajectory. There are a lot of behaviors on this slide that we have normalized as being, well, that's what happens, it comes with the territory. That's what happens when you do this work. And that's true because it's compassion fatigue, not necessarily because it's a healthy way of coping. And so it looks familiar because we're all doing it because we all have compassion fatigue. And so I offer this as an opportunity for us to think like, oh, I'm doing that thing again. What would Morgan Freeman say? <laughs> like, what do I need to try doing differently here so that I'm not thinking about murdering every person I talk to or every person who sends me an email or every request that I get, like how do I manage this so that I can do this work in a way that feels good? Now, I dream of the day where the conversation that happens when new hires, oh, sorry, let me interrupt myself. The other thing that happens is I think that on a lot of organizations, we are counting on these zealots to save us because they're the ones that have all the energy because everybody else is exhausted. And they're, we're like, well, here's a new person. They're here, let, like, let them do it. Like, let, knock yourself out. And then we'll just take, take bets until, to see how long it takes before they start hating people too. And so I imagine what it would be like if we had different conversations when new people come to work. Like, hey, listen, let me show you this slide. Got it in a webinar I went to a few years ago. This is what happens to people when they get into this work. It is a normal consequence of being in this, in, in this space. And I want you to be aware of this because what I want you to do is set really good boundaries now. This is a marathon and not a sprint. And it is more important to me that you set good boundaries now and say no so that you can take care of yourself than for you to try to do all of the things. And your instinct is gonna be to try to do all the things. And I'm gonna ask you to, re to really resist that urge. And let's think about what this could look like because I want you to succeed and be healthy and happy and find joy in the work that we're able to do here together every day. And I don't think that conversation happens very often. And in fact, more often, I think it's like, here's a scrub brush, like go start working or, oh my God, thank God you're here, like save us because this is just, we're all having a terrible time. Um, and it makes it very difficult for people to really uh, withstand the pressures that come with the work. So then sometimes people feel like if even the zealot phase is bad, then like, this is all just terrible. It is not inevitable. This can be cyclical. It's not a one directional thing. What I am offering to you is the opportunity to consider this is a warning sign when you're like, oh, I'm doing the thing again. Oh, I just, I just had a fantasy about that person dying in a fiery accident. Like maybe I should take a break or maybe I need to recalibrate here a little bit. Um, I, uh, I think there are ways that you can manage these things in these phases. I got a question in the chat about what happens if you're in the zombie phase, if there, is there a way to come back? 
And I think it's probably, I, I, what I would say is, is two things. One is that I would recommend anyone who's in the zombie phase to reach out and get professional assistance from a, a mental health professional and focus on somebody who has exposure to trauma to talk about this with. What I would also say is that there are lots of ways that people can help animals that don't involve doing this work exactly the way that we are. And it is okay for people to step away if they need to. My takeaway from for you in this work is not like quit your jobs, everybody like take off. Like I want you to be here and to succeed. But if you are really struggling, I would seek out um, I would seek out mental health professional to have these conversations with to get pointed in the right direction to see if they feel like there are steps you can take to sort of get yourself out. It's very challenging. It's not a dead end road, but you also have to be willing to do the work. And I don't have a magic pill I can offer. There's no magic silver bullet that I can say here, take this, and it'll be just fine. Because we're in pe we're people who are doing hard things, and so consequently, it's hard. Hard things are hard, right? So, um, I also sometimes get the question of like, what do you do if you think your coworker is a zombie, or what do you do if somebody that you work with is really struggling? Um, it reminds me of the meme that's like, at no at, at no time in the history of man has anyone ever calmed down by being told to calm down. So it doesn't always go well if you go to somebody. No matter, I mean, depending on your relationship, it could go badly if you go to them and say, "Hey, it seems like you're struggling. Like, let's have a conversation about." how to take care of yourself. Depending on the power dynamic, it could be an appropriate conversation, but it also might go very poorly. So my suggestion is to be there for people with what they need, but also to model the behavior um, and to take care of yourself because there's something about this kind of attraction when people have their lives together, when they are able to find joy, when they are laughing and when they are smiling, that is very attractive to people. And sometimes what results is people going, hey, why don't I get some of that? Like, I want more than that in my life. And there are ways that we can be a positive influence in our group around us um, in ways that helps to, to, um, to, to be a non-anxious presence and to help. But it only at, we have to do it in a way that feeds us where it doesn't have us just only in service to people's better moods at our own expense. So, so even if you've never seen this before, this probably feels very familiar to many of you. Um, and so the conversation then is like, well, what do we, you know, what do we do, right? There are a couple of other things I want to just talk about with symptoms. I can't, I don't have time to go into all of these. What I think is important, these come from the book Trauma Stewardship that I referenced earlier. There are a couple of points here that I feel like I really want to capture or call out. And the first is around anger and cynicism. I think a lot of times when people feel when they imagine somebody with compassion fatigue they picture someone crying all the time um when in fact in my experience the crying is such an overt behavior people who didn't identify as, as like a hardcore crier if they find themselves crying like as they're driving home as they're cooking dinner as they're having to go back to work on their monday if they find that they're crying all the time they're like gosh you know i feel like i didn't used to cry this much like what's going on for me and so they might go to the doctor and get on meds or they might go to a therapist and have a conversation or they might um or they might decide that they don't want to cry all the time and need to find something else to do in the in the work but anger is like that slow burn that creeps up on people and not everyone takes the time to have the conversation with Morgan Freeman about what their anger looks like and they're like I'm not mad what do you mean I'm not mad and everybody's like oh yeah really like you've got to be kidding me so so the people who are crying often will figure either resolve it or exit. And the people who are angry stick around for a really long time. Um, and anger is a normal reaction. We, we are people who believe in justice. We observe injustice and it makes us mad. Totally get it. What happens though is that we don't metabolize it and then it festers. And then it we're like angry all the time. And it also can lead to, to cynicism, right? Where everyone's a liar. Everyone is dishonest. Like people are making stuff up. People suck. I hate people. Like that whole thing. Um, and so we have to figure out how to metabolize that anger because um, it just sits there and it and it we do, it just is like another shirt we put on. We just keep on putting shirts and shirts and shirts and then we're like puffed out because we're just pissed all the time. Um, and so I have seen many people who are rage filled doing this work um, and, it, and it's a real problem, not only for their own well-being and their own mental health, but it can have a really negative impact inside of a system. And it really does, it does require our attention because it can create a toxic work environment that drives people away. Um, the next thing I would just say is around it's never being enough, right? Like when we have really long to-do lists and we know we're never gonna make it through our to-do list, our instinct is to try to do more. Um, and then we over-deploy and we bring a less sparkling, sterling version of ourselves to this work that requires our full effort and attention. Um, and also, of course, we're never gonna do all of the things. That's why we're in this large community trying to do it all together. 
And so we have to give ourselves a break, right? And recognize all we can do is what we can do. Like we're doing our part and our best is good enough. Um, and although for a lot of people, they feel like their best isn't good enough because they didn't solve the problem of pet homelessness today. Like, ah, oh, terrible. I mean, like not, it's not on any one of us to solve that problem on our own. So we really have to think about and be kind to ourselves about our contribution and the difference we make. And I can tell you right now that your best is good. It changes over time and your best evolves over time, but your best is good enough. And if you are really doing your best, it's not about having the adoption not returned or having the animal make it through surgery or the bill being passed or the prosecutor taking up the case, whatever. Your, your contribution matters, even if you don't get the outcome that you want. It's a little soapbox of mine. It's very painful to me to imagine folks feeling like their best isn't enough. So these are other symptoms here that I think are worth kind of considering and taking a look at. Some of them are, I think, pretty straightforward. Um, and also all of them available in the book that I referenced. Um, there's also, you know, feeling the sort of us against them mentality, um, fear. Fear is important. Fear is good. Uh, also, your body is not meant to be steeped in fear. And sometimes we can develop fear relationships with things that don't actually constitute a threat. Um, inability to listen, experiencing guilt, hopelessness and helplessness, feeling like no matter what we do, it doesn't make a difference. I'm here to tell you that it does every day you're making a difference. So these are all very common symptoms of compassion fatigue. And I am willing to bet that nearly everyone on this call has experience with at least one, if not all of these things. So you're in the right session. Um, what I also want to mention is that I hope that leaders care about this for um, a few reasons. I mean, obviously, I hope that leaders care about their people and want their people to thrive and be well and are committed to doing that. But even if you have a manager who simply does not care about the well-being of their staff, it's important that leaders understand that there are organizational impacts when you have a team of people who are experiencing compassion fatigue. It's not just like, oh, sucks for that guy. <laughs> like, hope they I hope they figure it out. Like, when you've got a bunch of people struggling, it impacts your ability to meet your mission and it can undermine the work that you're doing. So even if you're only focused on the task, having people who are suffering can lead to higher work. There's comp claims, there's higher turnover, there are disagreements, there's lack of flexibility, there's reluctance to change. There's all kinds of things that can get in the way. And so leaders really need to pay attention to this and they absolutely set the tone. And I will tell you for years, I have been called in by leaders and organizations who tell me, hey, listen, I've got this all figured out, but my staff seems to be struggling. Can you teach them how to deal with compassion fatigue? And I think that's, I'm really grateful to have the conversation. And also I'm aware that a lot of times the leaders are modeling really poor behaviors and also not focused on their staff's well-being in the same way that they're focused on animal well-being. And so we have to figure out how to have leaders hold both things, right? To prioritize the well-being of their team so that their team can prioritize their own selves, show up in their best way to care for the animals. It's not it's not that if they direct resources to an people, they're taking away from the animals. If you invest in people, it's actually giving more to the animals. It's not a zero sum, uh, sum game. Um, and so, um, so it matters. And also, this is a very big conversation. And if you are in any way struggling, if you're trying to do take this on and you're having a hard time, if you're having suicidal thoughts, if you have symptoms of PTSD, if you experience primary trauma and haven't done the work, with a therapist yet, I absolutely encourage you to access mental health services. And there are uh, resources in the resource sheet that I'm, I'll be sharing about where you can look to search to find a therapist. There are all kinds of options. If you are in an organization that has an EAP, you can um, you can probably get a referral there or get some free sessions. So, um, so there are ways that you can access it. And that's something actually that's gotten a little bit better with the pandemic to be able to do it remotely. So you know, this is uh, also a, a bigger conversation um, sort of broadly, but what we have to understand is that, as I mentioned earlier, our body is not built to be in a constant state of stress. Our stress response is meant to give us the juice we need to get out of a jam. But unfortunately, the jam we're in is our job. <laughs> we're there like all the time. So we can be sent into our sympathetic nervous system, which is where we are when we have the perception of a threat a lot. So this is a very kind of dumbed down description of the autonomic nervous system, but want to acknowledge that the sympathetic nervous system is, is this place where we are, when we have very limited options, where language is less available to us, where we can only be reactive, and the hormones cortisol and adrenaline are released. And you guys are familiar with this, with fight or flight with the animals in our care. 
Our parasympathetic nervous system, though, is where we are when we're able to be creative and choose from a lot of options and be intentional and be thoughtful and to this hormone called DHEA is released. Obviously, you can imagine that spending time in your parasympathetic nervous system is like is uh, is preferable, especially in work. Like we like to have access to language and being creative when we're sol sol solving problems in our work. But many of us are triggered into our sympathetic nervous system really dozens of times in a day. So our body is awash in these stress hormones that make it very difficult, both in the acute moments of stress, but then over time with a cumulative effect. So there are a few different ways. And again, these are all going to be in these resource documents that I share. There are several different ways that we can um, shift our physiology from our sympathetic to our parasympathetic nervous system. There are sort of by groups, there are like sort of, there's a whole category of breathing exercises. There's a lot of research around breath work and the impact it has. So there's different kinds of cyclical breathing. There's four square breathing, we inhale for four, hold for four seconds, exhale for four seconds, hold for four seconds. There's five, seven, eight breathing where you inhale for five, hold for seven, exhale for eight. Um, there are a bunch of different categories, but what that does is allow your brain to make the shift from sympathetic to parasympathetic. There's also stuff like orienting yourself to your environment. That could be like counting books on the bookshelves or pens in your pen holder. Um, it could be looking for the, like identifying the rainbow, looking for colors around you. I have a purple book, a blue book, a, a, my cup of thing here. I got a blue thing there. I got another blue thing here. I got a red mouse pad where you're just looking for colors that will help bring your amygdala back online and focus your energy and help you to understand you're not an immediate threat. There's also softening your pelvic floor. So your pelvic floor are the muscles that you use to hold in your urine stream. That's, those are also the muscles that dogs incidentally use to tuck their tails between their legs. So when those muscles are engaged, we're in our sympathetic nervous system. So we can practice softening those muscles so that we have the ability in acute moments of stress to go like, oh, I'm having that thing. And you can practice calming yourself so that you can bring your amygdala back online so you can have access to creativity and choosing from a lot of options and being intentional in your behavior. What is critical though is, is practicing when the stakes are low so that these things are accessible to you when the stakes are high. Largely because when we're freaking out, we have a very hard time remembering what helps us to not freak out. Um, and so in the same way that we practice fire drills when the building isn't on fire so that we know like what the process is, how we get out of the building and where we will meet up outside, we have to practice these things and calm ourselves in moments where we're not in acute stress so that when we're having our freak out, we can call upon it and have it available to us. So again, there are a lot of resources, but what I want you to understand is that your brain dictates your physiology. So if you are experiencing a stressful moment, if you are remembering a stressful moment, if you're talking about a stressful moment, if, some, if you're hearing somebody else tell you about their stressful moment, your body is having a stress response. It doesn't have to be just like somebody yelling at you or you know, dealing with a fractious animal. Like There are lots of different things that can cause a stress response. So we have to figure out how to manage our physiology to calm our brain, to pair with some one of these breathing exercises or bring our brain back online in these acute moments of stress to allow us to calm. The, and so there are these two elements, right? There's managing our breathing, orienting to the environment, but also acknowledging like it is normal to be stressed out. Like it's temporary, it's normal. We have to remember what works for us. And then we have to do the thing that works for us. And this is almost the hardest part because I mean, you guys know you're involved in training people on behavior change. It's really hard to change people's behavior, but it's almost harder to change our own behavior, right? Because we try to outsmart ourselves all the time. If you've ever done a new year's resolution and then failed on January 3rd, you know this dynamic. So what we have to do is figure out the thing that works for you and then have you commit to doing it to, uh, to make the change. And what I will tell you, we can talk about it sometime over a beer or a cup of coffee, is that when I went to my first training, I thought I didn't have compassion fatigue. I was really going to get the information and then was a, a dumpster fire of emotions the entire training. Um, and because I was like scaring people with how upset I was in this training, I was like, hmm, I should take some of this on. And what I recognize is that I have the ability to influence my own experience. I cannot control a damn thing around me. What I can control is how I respond to the thing. And there's real power in acknowledging that because otherwise I would spend my entire life trying to control everything, everywhere, including you, if I had the opportunity. Um, 
but um, but I can't, right? So uh, so I all I can do is control how I show up and how I want to think about things and how I want to respond to things and how I can commit to being a non-anxious presence, both for myself in my own body, but then also in my team. And I think what happens a lot of times is that we experience upset and then we want to like process it and share that with our team. And we do it in a way that actually adds to the anxiety in the group. And so it's important to talk about things. It's important to get support. But I also would advocate for getting support outside of your uh, immediate circle by talking to a therapist, by getting some sort of other person who doesn't, they're not going to know the entire context of your business, but it doesn't matter if they understand the context. You have the ability to talk to them and let them know what you're feeling and then have them offer help. Um, but what happens is because we're often talking to each other, it really ratchets the upset and, um, and, and adds to the anxiety in the system. So I think there are ways that we can train listeners to listen in the right way. We can be clear about what it is we want in these conversations. But I think a lot of us spend most of our time talking about the things that are hard instead of talking about the things that are going well. And it adds to the upset in the system in ways that maybe isn't always um, productive. What I also would say um, is that leaders absolutely have a role to play. And it can't just be like, oh, you should practice self-care or you should go figure out work-life balance. I'm obligated to take care of myself and to model the behavior so that my team knows that they have permission to do it themselves. Um, and, you know, and what that means is that I can't, like, I'm not working on weekends and sending emails to my team. Even if what I say is, hey, ignore this, like, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm just sending it because it's convenient for me. I actually will delay send so that it shows up when they're working, not just when I feel like doing it. There, there are messages that I send um, and I'm thinking about it constantly about how to support people in their well-being and model the behavior for my own well-being, but also to give them permission to take care of themselves. We have to think about what resources we have available and access those resources in our community and, and, and create a community in our shelter with a, a, with a work culture that supports people's well-being. And not like you have to be tough enough, not like if we talk about feelings, like bad things are going to happen. You don't have to have group hugs. You don't have to do trust falls. <laughs> you don't have to do anything that makes anybody uncomfortable, but you can create, you can prioritize the well-being of your staff, create and, um, and maintain a positive work, work culture. And then also, I think perhaps most importantly, is not weaponizing people's commitment to the cause and the mission to, to have them do more work. Like we all are short staffed. We all struggle with these same issues. And I think we have to really think about what we can reasonably take on. Each of you cannot solve this problem your own. You're, you're figuring out your one piece that you're able to sort of tackle. And you've got to give yourself a lot of grace about what you're able to accomplish and not feel obliged to do every single thing for every single animal. It's not possible. Um, and because we think that's what we should be doing, we disappoint ourselves every day and then we beat ourselves up over it. So one of the things that I think about, and then just one last thing before I wrap up, is I think a lot of times when people come to webinars like this, they're like, they think this is, this slide is going to be the thing that I'm going to spend the whole time talking about, like, prioritize, you know, prioritize self-care and just go do the thing. And like, I think most of us know really what self-care could and should look like for ourselves. And we choose not to do it um, because we don't make time, which is again, why Lindsay Hamrick's um, webinar is such an important piece. If we don't have work-life balance, we cannot carve the time out that we need in order to do the things. And we, we relate to this list as though it is the thing that we can do and that we have permission to do after we've done the thing we need to do for animals. And what I would say is that, in fact, you are deserving of doing these things, even if it's only for your own benefit, for, the, for your joy, for the joy in your family, with your friends, with the community. Like you are a deserving of these things, even if you never do anything else for animals. But also, if you are prioritizing in your life, taking care of animals, they are better served by you if you are focusing on these things. And you don't have to do all of these things. Pick one and start with one and take it on and, and, and give yourself the space to bring your best self to this work because the animals will be better served by it if you are able to do that. And when we live in a world of feeling like the work around us is out of control, that we people are making other decisions that are impacting us, that things are going on with animals and we can't control the number of animals coming into the door or the conversations we're having, there's a lot that feels out of control, especially over the last several years with the pandemic and all of the other attendant things. Life has felt out of control. And then 
there's this list of things you can control. And like memes are my love language and most of them are not work appropriate. <laughs> it's long and hard for work appropriate memes. But this is one that I, that really stopped me in my tracks when I looked at it because I feel like I, I find sometimes that I spend so much time thinking about the things I can't control. I lose track of the things that I can control. And this is a really robust list of things that if I spend any amount of time being intentional about will really improve my quality of life and the way that I engage in the world around me. But I very often pay very little attention to it and just hope it's going to work out because I'm so busy focusing on things I can't control. And that makes everything much harder. And so I guess in conclusion, you know, again, this is a big conversation and this is like the jogging of a lot of big concepts, but you all are doing really powerful things. And I would be willing to bet that most of you, when you are really struggling, spend a lot of your time thinking about what isn't going well and where you're struggling and what's hard about it and how your heart breaks. But you're doing really amazing things. You're making a difference for individual animals, for people, for people, individual people and families and communities. I really want to encourage you to think about focusing on, on what you do well and what those wins are, because the antidote for compassion fatigue is compassion satisfaction and really being thoughtful and aware and talking about and keeping front of mind all of the important impacts you have really can help put things into perspective. You know, I think a lot of times people get caught up, they're like, well, God, I'm doing all this work and bad things still happen. And like, without you, the bad things would still happen. Bad things happen. No matter what you do, bad things happen. But if you weren't in this fight and you weren't doing this, this work, some of the, the good things that you're doing wouldn't happen. And so we have to figure out how to balance those things and acknowledge like you are deserving of joy. This, this work with animals is meant to bring you joy. And there's something about it that you, you, there's a reason you show up every day. And if you think about it, you may have lost connection with it, but there is some joy you find. And acknowledging that, acknowledging your excellence, focusing on the things that you are doing well can really be a salve in these times when it feels like things aren't going well. So again, jogging tour, the resources document will be available to you in order to, um, to access. And, and those are plenty of different jumping off points to find the thing that is gonna be most useful for you. But I really wanna acknowledge how hard this is and appreciate you taking time to kind of have this conversation. And um, I will wrap up now to take any questions. I know that the hospital has been monitoring the Q&A and I'm happy to take any of those questions now and I'll stop sharing my screen in order to do so. Vincent, hello. Yes, hello, how are you doing? This is tr tremendous, thank you so much. So let me get directly to the questions. Yep. Um, do you think compassion fatigue, this is from Katie Anderson, do you think compassion fatigue is a symptom of burnout? I'm wondering about the overlap between the two. Yeah, I would say that the compassion fatigue is contingent upon exposure to trauma. And that's that's the thing. I mean, certainly burnout is its own set of problems. I think that what we have is burnout plus exposure to trauma, and that's what leads to compassion fatigue. Um, and, and it shows up in lots of ways that are both really obvious and then also really subtle and insidious <laughs> at individual and, and, and team and organizational levels, yeah. From also from Katie, uh, no, 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 no. Also, the, an anonymous uh, attendee asked, um, "How do you deal with hoarders who you believe when you be, who believe they are doing it in the name of rescue when they get in over their head? It causes us tr tremendous compassion fatigue." Yeah. Well, I mean, I think. Uh, file us under the category of like not being able to control other people as much as we would like to, right? And so, um, so I think that it's important that we have conversations about, um, you know, uh, uh, like about our own well being and taking care of ourselves. But what I would also say is that I think what is more useful is to actually identify particular behaviors and observable facts and impacts of that behavior. So that instead of saying, like, hey, I think you have compassion fatigue, what you could also say is, here is the thing I have observed, and this is the way it's showing up at work, and I want to problem solve it. Um, because if you're saying, like, if you're talking about feelings, there's a room for people to be like, I don't feel that way. I don't know what you're talking about. But if you can share observable behaviors and, and patterns of behaviors that you've observed and impacts of those behaviors on the animals, on the team, on the organization, that's a, a more useful way to have the conversation. Because you're not going to be able to tell somebody, like, I think you have compassion fatigue, and you should go do something about it. Because they're very likely not going to respond well in that situation. 
wanted to read you a real quick compliment. One of the best webinars I've attended in a very long time. That's from Constance. Hey, thanks, Constance. Let me just say, I teach the thing I need to learn the most, my friends. Like, we're in this <laughs> together. We're in this together. Next question. How do you deal with, uh, no, no, that's already been asked. Um, often a shelter leadership does lead by example in this cause. What specific tips would you give shelter directors or managers to lead by example, or at least open the conversation about setting or keeping strong boundaries? Yeah, well, I think, uh, I mean, I think it's two parts. One is that you have to be committed to having good boundaries yourself and saying no, and also encouraging your staff to say no and giving them the permission to say no. Lately, I've been thinking a lot about peas on a plate and acknowledging and, and making it clear, like we all can only have so many peas on our plate. And so if I am saying to you, Vincent, hey, I want you to put these other five peas on your plate, you have to think about what other five peas are going to come off, right? Because right. like you can't do all of it. And so, so as managers, I think we have to be really cognizant because even if I, as a leader, I'm saying to my team, hey, can you do this thing for me? I may be thinking like, if you have time, when you can get to it, whatever, but really it just feels like another P. And so people are like, oh my God, that's like one more thing. Like we have to be able to take things off and we have to be willing to say no. Like we don't have to just figure out how to do more with less. We have to do less with less <laughs> and less with the people that we have. And sometimes say no to doing new things in order to prioritize our staff and, and, and instead of chasing shiny objects and programs, really investing in our team and their well-being and saying hard is particularly difficult for people like us. Well, and I will add one other thing that Hillary did that I've never seen anybody do. When, when people did, she felt like people might've been getting disturbed outside of their normal work hours. She, she sent us all an email and said, you let me know who that is and I will personally follow up with them. So she doesn't just talk it, she definitely walks it. All right, next question. As a volunteer, do you suggest picking an, an area to specialize in instead of trying to be an expert in every area? Uh, say if you love transporting or intake or desk work. Right, well, I can say as a volunteer, as a leader of volunteers, um, I would say that my preference is always for the volunteers to check in with the staff to find out what where they're really struggling and not to assume. And like, and I say this not in particular to Elaine, but just to anybody, you know, my, my goal is, my hope is always that, that volunteers are organized around helping to support the staff and meeting the mission of the organization. And so in my role as a volunteer, I really want to understand where the gaps are and hear from staff about what I could do and like what the need is and then match my own skill set to that. So it's not just me picking the thing that I like the most or want to spend my time on, but really understanding where the need is and then plugging into that. That would be my best way to, to do it. And I, I think volunteers also, it's really great to have volunteers involved in this conversation. It's not just a staff or employee issue because volunteers are working with staff who have compassion fatigue. So it's even if it's not primary or secondary trauma, it's tertiary trauma that affects volunteers and their experience in an organization, which is another reason why it's so important to bring attention to it. And um, are there techniques available for this? Oh, this is rapid fire. So we only have a couple of minutes. Are there techniques available for uh, group therapy at rescues? Yeah, well, yes. I mean, uh, different people do things differently. Uh, obviously, there are lots of organizations that are trying to solve this. I know that there are folks who have reached out to grief counselors um, to have, um, to create an opportunity for staff to come, like to have like a monthly session where counselors are coming in and creating space to talk about this. Um, sometimes people want to talk about it in a group though. Sometimes they want to talk about it privately. So I know other organizations have had a day where a counselor has come in and people can book appointments with that person to have a conversation about how things are going. Um, so there are different different strategies working different places, but you know some people are interested in talking about things in a group, and other people are like, nope, I'd rather suffer <laughs> than, than have to talk to my colleagues about this. So it, it kind of depends on the dynamic in the group. All right, um, from um, Bob, uh, burnout often comes uh, do, comes from doing the same thing and dealing with the same process day after day. In some corporate structures, uh, individuals have developed growth plans that give exposure to various aspects of entire operations and in increments. Um, mm -hmm. Your thoughts on development and fatigue? Yeah, 
Yeah, that's an interesting one. I think this also comes into how to have work-life balance and how to not have everything be so chaotic. This was something that Lindsay talked about in her presentation and helping people to like to cross train um, and understand ways that we can have more support. Because a lot of times what gets us burned out is we feel like, oh my God, I'm the only person who can do this. And if I'm gone, like X, Y, Z isn't going to get done. Or when I'm gone, all these people are going to be burdened by me going off and taking my PTO. So I think that having an incremental approach to learning is good. Um, I think also um, having people cross-trained in order to have each other's backs to allow people to take time off without guilt is essential. Like everybody needs to, and everybody is deserving of time off. Like the labor movement was founded around not working people to death. And so <laughs> people died in the labor movement so that we could work 40 hours in a week. And so I've sort of taken it on as my personal, uh, my personal thank you and acknowledgement of those sacrifices to really stick to 40 hours. Sometimes I'm more successful than others, frankly. Nice. Yeah. Another question from, oh, um, is, as a very involved uh, volunteer, do you think the same prog progression course can occur over time? Um, have you seen volunteers recover without taking complete breaks and working on some of the helpful and amazing items mentioned in the webinar? Um, I absolutely believe that it is true for volunteers. Like I said, not only because your own commitment to the animals and then observing the, the you know, observing the terrible conditions that animals are in and the impacts that I mean, it can be challenging, even if you're only there once a week, but also your exposure. And then there's also awareness of suffering. So for sure, there's a similar trajectory for volunteers. Um, and I would say uh, that the best thing is acknowledging what you can control and what you can't. And acknowledging that that what you do in your three or four hours or however many hours it is in a week is enough, um, and to really to commit to like recognizing the scope of your ability to influence things, and that's really hard. Like I said, we're volunteering; we want to change the world, but we can't change the, the world all by ourselves, right? So we have to acknowledge what we're able to influence and what what we can't, um, and 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 be as supportive for ourselves and our co volunteers as we are for the staff. Nice. And one last question, and then I'll, um, how would you recommend encouraging volunteers to take time off or away? Oh, I guess that, nope, that question. As you know, things are really hard right now. Shelters are full. Euthanasia is up. How do you keep from getting demoralized? How do you stay positive and keep on keeping on when times are tough? Well, that is the million dollar question, right? I mean, I think that what we do, what I do is focus on the positive. Because there, a lot of that is talking about how hard it is, and it is hard, and we don't want to ignore what's hard. But I think also spending time thinking about and talking about the things that are still going well and where there are successes is is really important. And then also thinking about ways as things are hard, like prioritizing what the hardest parts are and figuring out what we are able to address at any particular time is going to be the way to do it. We can't solve all the problems, but we can take like one at a time, bring our attention to it, try to solve it, and then go to the next one after that. So it's um it's tricky. It's tricky, but I think it's I think it's possible. And I appreciate these are very challenging times. <laughs> There's no question. Okay, let me see. Um I'm having a little trouble with my uh with my login. So I don't know, Sarah, if you were on the line, if you could read the the um the close out. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining me and Vincent, along with Hillary Hager from HSUS. She was absolutely incredible to share her time with us today. Um, if we did not get to your question, you can email haasproject at americanpetsalive.org. We'll put that in the chat. And as a reminder, tonight's webinar recording will be distributed within three business days. In a moment, you'll see a brief poll about this webinar pop up. If you will give us a quick rating of how you felt about this webinar on a scale of one to five, with five being the best, that would be amazing. Our next event will be from Intake to Outcomes, Managing Summer Space Crises with Animal Case Management, um, which will feature Mara Hartzell, our Shelter Support Advisor for American Pets Alive, and that is next Tuesday, June 6th at 5 p.m., Central Time, we will share the registration link in the chat and keep an eye out on your emails for more details. Um, and I will toss it back to Vincent for a quick thanks and we'll close out. All right, thank you all for being there. And also thank you, Sarah, for, for filling in for me. You know how technology has decided to 
tell me I needed to log in again and now it won't give me my information. But Hillary, such a fabulous um, uh, webinar. As you can see in the chat, it was totally involved. Um, thank you so much for all the work you're doing, not only in your role as um, the, one of the vice presidents for the Humane Society of the United States, but also I know this is a passion of yours. So I uh, thank you so much. Uh, do you yeah. have any final words? Well, I just want to thank everybody for taking the time. And I see the nice comments in the chat. I don't do this just because I like to see nice comments in the chat. But I also really appreciate that people took the time and that this is really hard right now. And, and I thank you for what you're doing for animals. Um, so it's important to me that you, that we figure out how to give you the tools to stick around. Um, there's a lot of joy to be had in this work. And I hope we can figure out how to, to access it. So thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you all. Have a great week. Uh, we will be back with um, a follow-up web, well, a, another webinar coming soon, as uh, Sarah mentioned, and uh, we'll go out there and continue uh, helping people and helping animals. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye.